We are very pleased to have here tonight uh, Dr. Arkhard, and please thank, uh, join me in welcome. I'm very glad to be in Charleston. This is my second visit to Charleston Southern. I spent part of yesterday and part of today at the Citadel. I'm spending tonight and most of tomorrow here, and then going on to College of Charleston to do a bunch of really interesting things. And I've been taking Uber everywhere. <laughs> I've been taking Uber all over Charleston. And an amazing thing has happened. A truly amazing thing has happened. I have, with a couple of flicks of my thumb, gotten a complete stranger to pick me up in an unmarked car. <laughs> then drive me somewhere. And then, with no cash changing hands, a handful of computer algorithms and other strangers transfer little bits of information called dollars from my American Express card to the bank account of this complete stranger who is driving me from one point to another. And all of this is taking place without force or without fraud. I've not been murdered. <laughs> I've not been robbed by my Uber driver. And this has been in the absence specifically of government regulations saying that ride-sharing companies and ride-sharing entrepreneurs like people driving for Uber are not allowed to murder and rob their customers. This is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. And indeed, the transparent rating system available for available through a company like Uber is extremely reliable. I can look and see, oh, here's this guy. He has a rating of 4.8. We chat. His car is clean. Things are fantastic. Things are wonderful. We, total strangers, are able to cooperate to mutual advantage in a way that benefits me, in a way that benefits this total stranger, through the forces of a competitive market. This is something I find absolutely fascinating. I find absolutely amazing. And in a very deep and spiritual sense, I find it absolutely beautiful. And that's the direction in which I'm going to be moving things over the course of about the next 30 minutes or so, after which I will open the floor to questions. I'll answer pretty much anything you guys want to talk about. And we're going to consider liberty. We're going to consider economics and a Christian worldview. And we're going to consider how we reweave shalom in the workplace and how the Christian university is an exercise in helping us reweave shalom or helping us to recreate and reestablish the peace of God on earth. <coughs> Probably my two <coughs> favorite computer games are Civilization and SimCity. <laughs> so great. I, five years ago now, bought, um, bought SimCity, not SimCity, not SimCity, Civilization Revolution for my phone for six bucks. I think so for roughly the cost of a, like a deeply discounted movie ticket, I'm able to get Civilization on my pocket supercomputer that I can then use to pass time, use to entertain myself, use to kill those couple of minutes that, or use those couple of minutes that pop up from here uh, for, from time to time. And I also recently discovered that there's a there's after I got a new iPhone, there's a there's an iPhone version of SimCity that features lots of in-app purchases, but the price of the basic game is zero dollars. Now granted, the price of the basic game is zero dollars, but you come to a point at which you realize that, well, I'm going to have to probably spend some real money if I want to do this next set of things that I want to do, but still, it's really, really fun and it's really, really interesting. In these games, you're in a sense kind of a central planner. In those games, you're a, you're a central planner. You're, you're centrally planning a city. In Sim City, you're centrally planning a civilization. In civilization, you're fighting wars, you're conducting research, you're doing all sorts of things as almost this kind of godlike figure who just says, oh, I have built the city of Athens, and the city of Athens needs a cathedral. Make it so. And I have also built the city of Corinth, and the city of Corinth needs a granary. Make it so. Oh, the Germans are angry. I shall war with the Germans. Make it so. Yeah, well, that's fun, and that's interesting. As sort of a budding pacifist, I try to uh, I try to play civilization without actually doing anything violent, okay. and that actually works pretty well in a game like Civilization. Now, granted, sometimes you have to wipe out the barbarians, but it is but you can actually do that in Civilization. 
My idea for passive risk didn't work quite as well. <laughs> but, <laughs> but nonetheless, you can you can do this in civilization. And both of the, both of those games are really interesting because they're, they're kind of a metaphor for the way that a lot of people look at the world. A lot of people look at the world as if it's as if it's a game to be played. In a famous passage of the theory of moral sentiments, Adam Smith talked about something he called the man of system. And he said the man of system is very wise in his own conceit. And the man of system imagines that he can move the members of a great society around with the same ease with which he moves around pieces on a chessboard, or with the same ease with which he moves around military units and cities and cathedrals and power plants in civilization or sim city. I have noticed that in playing SimCity on my phone, this makes the game much easier. If you want, if you don't want the power plant there, you can, at zero cost, move the power plant to another part of your city. No, those houses are in the way. You can, at zero cost, pick up and move the houses, the buildings, etc., to another part of the city. Civilization in SimCity, in a sense, kind of indulged my inner man of system. Now, granted, in both Civilization and SimCity, the natives can get restless. People can get angry, the voters can come to not like you. <coughs> but, but we don't really observe at a very fine level, at almost a granular level, how civilizations actually emerge and how civilizations um, evolve and flourish. My six year old son's favorite game is Minecraft, and my four year old daughter's favorite game is Minecraft. And I think Minecraft is probably a far better metaphor for the way that a great society emerges than either civilization or SimCity. Now granted, Minecraft has rules. Minecraft has rules when you face certain constraints. If you're playing in, if you're playing in, uh, in survival mode, then you start with nothing and you have to, kind of like Robinson Crusoe, build up to something. You literally punch a tree or you use your fists to tear a tree up until you can get planks, then you can use those to create a pickaxe, and you can mine rocks and minerals and things of that nature. And one of the things that's really interesting about Minecraft is that it has evolved into this big decentralized network of people across YouTube, people across other parts of the internet, people across different forums, and people in various online communities that get together to play Minecraft, a game that effectively doesn't really have a whole lot in the way of rules. So different servers and different Minecraft entrepreneurs, so to speak, will come up with various games, they'll come up with various rules. There is actually a server created, created and dedicated to, created for and dedicated to autistic children. So someone noticed a need and said, hey, you know, we need, uh, you know, my autistic son loves playing Minecraft, but he doesn't like getting ganged up on and killed if he logs onto this particular server. I'll make my own. I'll succeed in a sense from these various worlds of Minecraft, I'll create, I'll innovate and create my own little world in which my son and people like him can go and succeed and flourish. And this is amazing. There are all sorts of different ways that people are using Minecraft to teach, they're using Minecraft to learn, they're, they're, there's no right way to do it. It's this grand, beautiful, and great conversation that I think is a beautiful metaphor for what happens when we let people be free, when we let people innovate, when we let people make their own choices and make their own decisions. America calls itself the land of the free. Land of the free, the home of the brave. My country tis of the sweet land of liberty. Think for a moment about what these things mean. What does freedom mean? What does liberty mean? Why are these useful? Well, liberty and freedom are interesting and they're useful as a means to an end. They're useful as a means to an end in that in a society where people are free, people are going to be able to flourish, as Aristotle said. <coughs> if people are going to be able to flourish, they're going to be able to live meaningful, beautiful, prosperous lives. The other day I was trying to kind of write a personal mission statement so to speak, and I want to, um, I want to contribute to a world in which people are free, virtue, or free, good, and rich. 
I want to help to create a world in which people are free, in which people are good, in which people are rich. Free for its own sake. Free because you're a human, because you're an individual, because you're created in the, in the image of God. And we wonder sometimes, what does it mean to be created in, in the image of God? What does it mean to partake of the nature of God? What does it mean to partake of the divine essence, as, as I've heard it called from time to time? Well, we're, we're rational agents. We can use reason. We can make decisions. We can choose. We can create. God, when he was finished with his, with his creation, looked at everything and called it very good. To violate the liberty of a person created in the image of God is to do violence to one of God's greatest creations. I think that's something that's really, really important. When we respect another's freedom, when we respect another's liberty, when we respect another's dignity to make their own choices, whether those choices be good or bad, then we are fundamentally kind of engaged in an act of worship or engaged in, a, in, 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 an, act of, uh, in an act of reverence toward toward God and his creation. We recognize that we're not sovereign, but God is. So a world in which people are free. I think that's really, really important. A world in which people are good. A world in which people are good. Well, what is it about liberty that allows for goodness? You can't, pour, you can't force people to be good. You can't force people to be virtuous. You can punish iniquity. You can punish people who steal, you can punish people who cheat, you can punish people who lie, but you can't force people into lives of virtue. And indeed, I think only under conditions of liberty can real, meaningful, true virtue emerge. I can, um, you know, I can love, well, no, excuse me, I can't love my neighbor necessarily. I can care for my neighbor, I can clothe my neighbor, I can keep my brother if I'm forced to do so at gunpoint, but it's not really clear to me that that, is, that, that's, that's, that that has a whole lot of real moral quality to it. Because remember, you remember what Jesus said when he talked about uh, <coughs> adultery and he talked about murder. He said, you know, you've, seen, you've heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery. I tell you, if you look at a woman lustfully, then you've committed adultery with her in your heart. Um, you've heard it said, don't commit murder, but if you call your brother a fool, then you've committed murder. You can force people to do things that look virtuous, but you cannot create actual virtue. You can change habits, you can change actions, but you can't change the heart. And therefore, I think, liberty is extremely valuable, and liberty is extremely useful. Now, both of those are kind of philosophical and theological points, or philosophical and theological arguments for, for liberty, but paraphrasing Bones McCoy, darn it, Jim, I'm an economist, not a theologian. I'm an economist, not a philosopher. Okay. So that leads us to the third thing. My wheelhouse, my area of expertise, rich. I want to live in a world where people are free, in which people are good, in which people are rich. Well, first of all, what do we mean? Um, what do we mean by rich? Well, the first cut, we want to think about we want to think about being rich as material standards of living. Do people have enough food, clothing, and shelter to live lives, to appreciate their freedom, and to live lives of virtue? Do they have enough food, clothing, and shelter in order to live fully human lives? And for the better part of history, the answer to that was probably not. As Deidre McCluskey has argued in a series of books, The Bourgeois Virtues, published in 2006, Bourgeois Dignity, published in 2010, Bourgeois Equality, which we're hoping it will be published in 2016, and a book with me, which we're hoping will also be published next year, um, tentatively titled The Bourgeois Deal, or tentatively titled Leave Me Alone and I'll Make You Rich. We haven't decided, we haven't decided, we haven't decided which title we're actually going to use yet. Um, we're looking at the ways in which life has changed, and we're looking at the condition of, she mostly, looking at the condition of the human species over the last million years, or 10,000 years, or 250 years. And for almost the entirety of human history, people lived on the equivalent of $3 a day adjusted for inflation. 10,000 years ago, average person lived on about $3 a day. Think about the last thing you spent three bucks on. <coughs> Imagine that you had only enough resources to get that one thing. You're in the world, you are naked, you're unsheltered, you have no food, and you have the equivalent of three bucks. 
And then you get another three bucks the next day, and another three bucks the next day. <coughs> Life's going to be hard. Life's going to be nasty. Life's going to be brutish. Life's going to be short. And for most people, life was short. You know, life expectancy in the 20s at the height of the Roman Empire. Life expectancy, life expectancy in the 40s in the 19th century, particularly, particularly in Great Britain. How many of y'all have played the organ train? Speaking of great radio games. How many of you have died of dysentery? <laughs> All right. You have died of dysentery. <clears throat> well, that's an unfortunate happening when you're playing Oregon Trail. And indeed, there's a $0 version of Oregon Trail that's available for your iPhone. And I don't know if I've died of dysentery yet playing the iPhone version of Oregon Trail. But that was the reality of life for the better part of, of our species, the better part of, of human history. You died of dysentery. You died of dysentery trying to get to Oregon. You died of something. You died at 45. I had a friend who put on Facebook one time, and she wished she lived in the 19th century when things were so much simpler. And I said, yeah, you know, a world where you're working from dawn to dusk to have enough calories to, to live, and, and you and everyone you know is dead of tuberculosis by age 45. <laughs> All right. And that's the reality. That's the reality of the world in which the world people inhabit. How many of you like to smell auto exhaust? Mmm, yeah, it's gross, isn't it? <laughs> Cities are polluted. Cities are so polluted by cars, and they're so polluted by the oil economy. So therefore, we must do something to go back to what we had before cars. Well, what did we have before cars? Horses and horse-drawn carriages. So if you're not breathing auto exhaust in New York City in the, say, 18th, 18th and 19th century, what were you breathing? Pulverized horse manure, which is way worse for you. Way worse for you than auto exhaust. So, while auto exhaust may not be good as such, auto exhaust may not be good as such, and indeed it certainly isn't, it's probably better than a lot of the alternatives. <coughs> and indeed, like I said, I've been taking Uber pretty much everywhere I've wanted to go. Um, in Charleston so far over the last couple of days, and you have a lot of places that are in fact fighting against these kinds of innovations. These kinds of innovations will probably actually reduce our exposure to auto exhaust and reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. And, uh, and things of that nature. A lot of us were very, very poor. Now a lot of us are very, very rich. A lot of us, well, so everybody used to be poor. Now, a lot of people are rich. And a lot of other people are getting rich. We have observed the greatest move out of material poverty in pretty much the history of the human species over the last couple of decades. Beginning in about 1750, give or take a couple of decades, we had this thing called the Industrial Revolution. And as a result of the Industrial Revolution, standards of living increased dramatically over the course of, you know, 200, 250 years, from a world in which people were living on $3 a day to a world in which people in rich countries are consuming about $130, $130, $137 a day worth of food, clothing, shelter, material goods, iPhone games, um, Netflix, etc., etc., etc. et cetera. Netflix is great because I, I saw on I saw on Reddit one time that uh, you know, Netflix does you a real favor, but at the end of, at the end of an episode they give you like the 15 second countdown to, to decide whether you want to do anything for the rest of your day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you get, you get to have all this neat, neat stuff that makes your life less nasty, less brutish, less short. We're extremely wealthy. Why are they extremely wealthy? Well. We're extremely wealthy largely because of the institutions of a liberal capitalist economy. A couple things happen. First, society's told the man of system, you know, stop. Stop trying to control everything. Stop trying to control access to markets. We developed a world in which we came to understand that, well, no, it's not necessarily, you know, order doesn't come from the top down. Order emerges from the bottom up. And specifically, Order emerges from the bottom up in a world where people have secure property rights and have, therefore, incentives to use resources wisely, to increase their value, and to earn income by helping other people. To earn income by helping other people. We also have a world, we created a world where markets were open and competitive. Open and competitive. And in an open and competitive market, 
You don't really have the luxury of preventing competition or robbing people. If you want to get rich, you have to invent a better mousetrap. If you want to get wealthy in an open and competitive market, you have to come up with a better way to do things. You have to come up with an iPhone. You have to come up with Seattle Supersonics t-shirts. You have to come up with Chick-fil-A, <laughs> not bless it. <laughs> Chick-fil-A. Right? A project for, the, for one of you who might be in microeconomics. Um, is the demand curve for Chick-fil-A sandwiches such that it's actually profit increasing on Chick-fil-A's part to restrict output by being closed on Sunday? I don't actually know. I don't actually know. Now notice this is not, this is not does Chick-fil-A increase demand for the product by being open, by not being open on Sunday and signaling their, their, uh, their fidelity to Sabbath keeping, but rather holding, holding demand curve constant is it such that they can actually cut back on output, raise their price, and earn more profits? There, I don't necessarily know. But nonetheless, Chick-fil-A sandwiches, and Chick-fil-A waffle fries, and Chick-fil-A peach milkshakes are undeniable proof of the goodness of God. <laughs> when we have these things, when we have incentives to produce these things, then everybody is well. Now then, I noted a minute ago that in a world with secure property rights, the way to get rich is to make other people better off. The way to get rich is to, is to make other people better off. And Adam Smith indeed said that it was the division of labor that was the source of human prosperity, and the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. When we have a strong division of labor, when we have a strong division of labor and lots of specialization, we get more output or conversely, we can get the same amount of output with less effort and fewer resources. This is something that absolutely blows my mind. Like every time I teach, every time I teach comparative advantage in my classes, for the seller of a good, they earn a, high, they earn a higher income as a result of being able to trade. For the buyer of a the good, they're able to pay less as a result of being able to trade. So, buyers get cheaper stuff, sellers get higher incomes, we have more total output, and the world is ultimately a better place as a result. I no longer mow my own grass, and I haven't for a very, very long time. Why? Opportunity cost of my time is too high. The opportunity cost of my time is too high relative to the opportunity cost of someone who can do it way better than I can. So, I'm able, as a buyer of lawn mowing services, able as a, as a buyer of lawn mowing services, to get cheaper lawn mowing than if I did it myself. And the seller of my lawn mowing services is able to, uh, is able to get a higher income in terms of economics lectures, we'll say, than he would otherwise get if he were, if he were, uh, if he were producing it himself. Now, it's often said that economics is a fundamentally value-free science, and indeed it absolutely is. Economics is value-free, meaning that it cannot tell you what's wrong or right, it can't tell you whether God is there or, or, or what have you. But nonetheless, I think some of the central ideas in economics related to exchange rest on fundamentally ethical postulates. Consider what, consider what is assumed in an exchange. Consider what's assumed in an exchange. If I offer to trade you something, what can you say? The rule of my class is actually is if your phone rings, I answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Consider that a warning. <laughs> hey, is Josh there? No, he's in class. Uh, can I take a message? No. Who's this? Press card. It's happened to it happened to one of my students a few weeks ago. The phone rings, I answer it. It says, uh, oh hey, is Grace there? No, uh, this is Professor Cardin, she's in class. Can I take a message? Like, uh, just tell her her dad called. <laughs> <laughs> Once when I was, uh, uh, the first time I ever taught, you know, the first time I ever taught principles of, of economics was a summer when I was in graduate school, and I put on the syllabus, every time your phone rings, you, I'll, I'll pose a five-point penalty on you. And uh, uh, then my phone rang. <laughs> <laughs> so being a fair and just person, I added five points to everybody's school. <laughs> Consider what happens with trade. You can say one of two things yes, sir. in an offer of trade. Sorry? Yes or no? Yes or no, absolutely. You can say yes, or you can say no. 
You, can, you will say yes if, the, if you find the if you find the author <coughs> Adam Hayes. You will say no if you don't. Now then, think for think for just a couple of minutes about what. what <coughs> you, bless you, bless you. Think about what sorts of moral assumptions are embedded in the institutions of exchange. Before you can say no to something, you kind of have to have the right to say no. And that's a deep and profound insight, I think, we're looking to And particularly when we're doing economics and we're talking about exchange, we're assuming the liberty of the individual to say yes. We're assuming the liberty of the individual to say no. And this is going to have very important information generating properties. If you uh, have read Friedrich Hayek, or when you do read Friedrich Hayek, um, have you read Friedrich Hayek? Oh, one group. Okay, good. Okay, so, okay, so vigorous nodding on Hayek. I'm glad. <laughs> um, you know, Hayek talks about the information generating properties of markets and market exchange. So, markets generate valuable information about the value of resources in different lines of production and they generate valuable information about people's preferences. Furthermore, they rest again on the assumption that you have the right to refuse. And this is something that is somewhat unique historically. There are a lot of places in which the idea of refusal is just sort of not an option. The king says, we need a cathedral. Make it so. The Pharaoh says, we need pyramids. Make it so. The master says, I want you to pick cotton. Make it so. We've come a long way. We've come a long way. And the idea of exchange, the idea of exchange, the idea of a free market in which people have the liberty to buy and sell as they see fit, I think is ultimately God glorifying, ultimately God honoring, and ultimately, in a sense, reverential for his goodness and his creation. Because when we offer a trade and someone refuses, and then we forego the opportunity to use violence to compel someone to cooperate with us, what we're doing implicitly is we're respecting the, we're respecting the dignity of that person who might possibly be um, might possibly be across the table from us. Now, that sounds like a relatively simple thing. It sounds like a relatively uh, um, trivial thing. But it's the fountain of the wealth of nations. Division of labor and specialization cause higher productivity. The division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. <clears throat> the extent of the market is, in turn, going to be determined in part by the cultural, ethical, political, and social norms and rules that govern the way that people interact with one another. So, if we have a regime of secure private property rights, where we recognize and where we enforce people's liberty to say no to an offered exchange, then, then, the only way to get rich is to expand other people's opportunities. You can't get rich by taking other people's stuff. You can't get rich by taking other people's stuff. And when you, have to get, and when you try to get rich by taking other people's stuff, you're ultimately consuming real resources merely to effect a transfer. You're consuming your resources merely to effect a transfer, not to actually create any new wealth. So you make the world poorer. Right? Thieves. Make the world a poorer place. I had to cancel class one day in 2008. My students, of course, were devastated. Because I mean, there's, there's nothing, there, there, there's, the, the, only, the only thing worse than having to cancel class is letting students out of class. Uh, yeah, they, just, they hate that. They hate that. Um, so I know, I, know that, I know that never happens here. But um, I had to cancel class one day because I had gotten, uh, I, I got a, a phone call from the police saying that our house had been broken into. And guess what? I went home and expected them to find, expected to find their house in the ransack. No, they had taken, they rifled through my wife's jewelry box. They had taken our TV and they had taken a laptop. They kicked down the door in the process. Fortunately, they left like my iPod. They left all of our financial documents of that nature. But this is this is an illustration of how getting rich by taking other people's stuff makes the world a poorer place. 
real resources are consumed by these guys who are taking the time and energy that they could otherwise spend doing something else to try to get my stuff. Let's imagine that these guys had, uh, let's imagine they value their time at 20 bucks an hour. We'll say, let's imagine that it took them two hours in total. So two guys, total of two hours it took them to get my TV, get my laptop, bust down my door. And in that case, you have $80, two guys, two hours, $20 an hour, $80 worth of resources consumed not to create anything new, but to merely transfer ownership of my TV and my laptop from <coughs> me to these guys. All right. Now it doesn't it doesn't take a whole lot of uh, doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to see that in a world of thieves, we're not going to get rich. A world in which we try to get a world in which the the way that we make ourselves better off is by stealing from one another. We're not going to have a whole lot of it. Um, in a world where we have secure property rights, though, then if these guys had wanted my TV and my laptop, they would have had to offer me something that I prefer to my TV or my laptop. A year's worth of lawn mowing services or something like that. Then in that case, the door stays intact. So the resources we had to use to replace the door, those get used for something else. I have my lawn mowed more frequently. Uh, I still have my TV and my laptop, and the resources I use to replace my TV and laptop um, can again also be used to create something else. That's a world in which we get rich, and a world in which we've gotten rich over low these last few uh, over low these last few centuries, <coughs> because we've had secure property rights, we've had open and competitive markets, and therefore we've had the development of a kind of prosperity that's unlike anything the world has ever seen. No one planned it. God's not sitting up there playing civilization and saying, we need a temple here. Think. <laughs> or, oh, you know what? I should put a road here. Hmm. Oh, look, my sins are happy because I put a park down here or something like that. You know? God's probably not playing civilization. Okay? God's probably not playing Sin City. Nor, for that matter, are the members of city council and, and people in government playing Sim City or, uh, or civilization. We're rich because we're free. And I want to speak for just a couple of minutes before we, before we take questions on the idea of a Christian university and the reweaving of shalom through the way that we work. So, um, Scott mentioned I'm, among other things, a, a research fellow, a senior research fellow at the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. And the Institute has published a book, or a couple of books, dealing with kind of precisely these sorts of issues. And in one of those books, a theologian named Hugh Welchel talks about the difference between a two-chapter gospel and a four-chapter gospel, and then what it means to reestablish the peace of God in a fallen and broken world in light of these things. The two-chapter gospel is the one that a lot of us probably grew up with. Fall and redemption. Fall and redemption. You once were lost, but now you're found. End of story. Is by you know, grace that you're saved, done. And that's, probably, that's, a, that's a little bit lacking. I mean, there, there are elements, a lot of elements of truth to that. But I think the, I think the, gospel, is a little, the gospel is richer than that. There's a four-chapter gospel. Now then, notice, notice, since this is being taped, I am not in any way, shape, or form suggesting a works-based salvation. Under any, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're watching this, that is not what's going on. I'm not saying that, that I'm not saying the gospel, that, that gospel is incomplete. I'm saying, rather, that I agree with Hugh Welchel that, that the gospel ultimately has, uh, ultimately has four chapters. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. So God creates them, we screw it up, we get redeemed, and now our lives, our lives as redeemed people, as reconstituted individuals in the image of God with the Holy Spirit, is to, to bring the peace of God, bring the peace of God in the world, to reweave shalom, in other words, to to restore Eden, as it were. There's a, a, an environmental group on campus at Sanford that is called Restoring Eden, that is, is, is seeking to do 
uh, and seek to do exactly that with respect to, with respect to the natural world. How do we recapture and recreate and reweave this piece of God in the world? Consider a pizza delivery driver. Consider a pizza delivery driver. How is a pizza delivery driver expressing the goodness and glory and love and person of God? How is he reweaving the peace of God merely through the act of delivering pizzas? Think about that for just a second. How's the pizza delivery driver reweaving, helping to recreate, reestablish the peace of God on earth? Well, first he's laboring, and indeed we're created as laborers, we're told. In the Garden of Eden, or Adam and Eve were told in the Garden of Eden, you know, work the garden, build the earth, and do it, so on and so forth. Uh, cultural mandate. Um, so, he, so he's engaging in an act that is very much like God's act, labor. He is working to minister to people. He's working to minister to people, and specifically people he may not necessarily know. He's helping them to enjoy the goodness. He's helping them to enjoy the goodness of the God who's created a world in which we can have delicious pizza. And pizza is good. Pizza is good, much like God is good. And so we can enjoy something delicious. Um, he's earning an income, and in so doing, supporting his family, perhaps supporting a number of different, a uh, number of different causes, in which in which he might believe. And he's helping to create prosperity for his customers. He's helping to create prosperity for the people who are supplying him <coughs> with goods and materials and things of that nature. He is ultimately, through his very action as a laborer, as someone who is engaged in creative work, as someone who is just delivering pizzas, expressing, and in a sense sort of becoming, coming into fellowship with, the very attributes of God. I think we can do that in the workplace. We can do that in public policy. We can do that in a bunch of different settings. We can do that by helping to create and establish and protect a world in which people are free, a world in which people have liberty, a world in which people have the dignity to innovate, and therefore, a world in which people have the capacity to be good and the ability to become great. 